Oke, okay, hi, hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to Talks on by Kelas Data Ikra. I am Indian Rahmanda, uh, Chief Technology Officer Officer of Ikra, and tonight I'll be hosting the Talks on number 21, utilizing data science in tech-based financial company with Home Credit Indonesia. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I would like to explain about Ikra. Ikra is a capability provider in data, technology, and business areas for corporations and individual professionals. So we aim to solve talent and capability gaps in the fourth industrial era. So ICRA have various of programs, and one of them is Class Data. So Class Data is a new program family by ICRA, which delivers data classes open for everyone. Now uh, we are running Talks On, part of the Class Data program. It's a live streaming webinar led by a professional and data experts sharing insights about data itself. And another uh, program that I would like to introduce you to you guys is the Solver Society. So Solver Society is a bit different than Class Data. Uh, it's an exclusive community that provides project-based uh, learning where you can collect portfolios, conduct research <coughs> with expert mentors and Uh, practitioners. Uh, we have thematic issues for each month, so it will be different each month. And this month, we are bringing up issues about global warming and climate change, uh, issue that are so relevant but a bit forgotten because of the pandemic. So we're bringing it up uh, back again. Uh, so uh, just uh, if you're like, if you're interested, just register by clicking uh, ikra.com slash for Society. I'll repeat that, www.ikra.com slash solver dash society. Uh, also, you can uh, see the link on the chat. Thank you, Indira. Also, I'd like to introduce our partner for this month talks on uh, Home Credit Indonesia. Uh, Home Credit is a tech-based financial services company. Their vision is to transform the way the world shops helping their customers realize their dreams and ambitions, and by being uh, their innovative shopping partner that combines seamless financing and great deals for everyone every day. They empower they, their customers and give them confidence to achieve their goals. So from financing, credit cards, to e-money, they got it all covered. Their presence can be found both online and offline. Uh, okay, um, let's get down to business. So special in this month in October 2020, class, class data by ICRA is collaborating with tech, uh, with tech Talk by Home Credit Indonesia. Uh, with the theme, with the main theme, data science in tech-based financial company. As I've mentioned before, tonight, the first talks on, uh, we are going to discuss about how to utilize or utilizing data science in a tech-based financial company by Kirill Odinstoff. He is the head of data science from Home Credit Indonesia. For those of you who are curious about Mr. Kirill, I'll share a short profile uh, of Mr. Odinstoff very briefly. So Kirill Odinstoff is the head of data science at Home Credit Indonesia with more than eight years of proven experience in building and leading a team of data enthusiasts. He is skilled in statistical modeling, predictive analytics, predictive modeling, tax mining, and risk management. He is an expert and with a master's degree in probability mathematical statistics and econometrics from Charles University in Prague. So everyone, please welcome Mr. Kirill. Hello, uh, Kirill. It's an, honor, it's an honor to introduce you as the main speaker for today. How are you doing? Oh, thank you very much. I'm very good. Bike. Great. Awesome. So thank you, uh, Kirill, for uh, uh, for being with us uh, today. So I hope you you will enjoy this uh, session. Well, before we start, uh, I want to inform a couple of rules about our talks on about our session this uh, today tonight. Please stay tuned uh, in our talks on because at the end of our session, I'd like to invite to all of you to join the game. Uh, called Cypher Challenge. Uh, there will be two Samsung A11 cell phones from Home Credit Indonesia for two lucky participants who win the games. Also, you can update tonight's Talks On to your Instagram story and put the best impression of our Talks On tag 
at ikra underscore id that's at e i w k r a underscore id and also class data underscore ikra and all of course home credit indonesia all in english spelling yeah. because we prepared two discount vouchers for class on by ikra that are worth uh two hundred thousand rupiah for two lucky followers so don't miss out we got two beautiful handphones and two classes from, from class data ikra and at the end of the session uh please don't forget to submit your feedback uh because it helps us uh, a lot uh, in making the sessions better for you guys as well so without further ado kirill um i'd like to give you the stage well more like a virtual stage <laughs> to you and then i hope uh, we can learn a lot from you today uh thank you very much andy thank you very much for inviting us and uh, for the introduction uh just a quick note sorry uh host has has disabled participant sharing screen i cannot share my screen if you could somehow yeah uh it will magically uh, okay. be available for you yeah. okay thank you magic is, is happening <laughs> the magic is there yep uh yeah let me start sharing so I, I i hope you see my screen please just let me know if you don't so i don't start to yes we can see we can see in full screen mode but but as a speaker but as, it's as a, as a speaker uh, view so yes. we see yeah we see two slides the okay wait how can i change it so you see two slides right yeah i see two slides uh, i see what you should have seen <laughs> Sorry for complication. No let worries. Just, uh, let's try it like this. So, is it? Yeah. Better? Now it's perfect. Great. Thank you. Uh, so again, thank you very much for introduction. Thank you everyone for coming. And um, uh, let, let's begin. I wanted to have some introduction in my limited Bahasa, but since we had technical problems, I forgot most of my words. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, from the beginning, um, I would like to uh, I would like to give some brief introduction also about myself. Uh, I think Andy already did a good job, so I will just mention what he didn't. Um, so most like other interesting stuff. So I'm originally from Russia, from Siberia, which is almost the same same some time zone as Indonesia, but very very north. Uh, I live in Czech Repu I lived in Czech Republic most of my life. And uh, most of my working life, I've been somewhere in mathematics or in modeling or something like this. So I'd like to share with you some of my experience that I acquired throughout this time. Some stuff is obviously my opinion. So if you're disagreeing, it, it could be true. Yeah, I just want to share with you my vision and how I view it. Please also feel free to ask questions. I will be gladly, we have some time for questions and answer. I will gladly answer. Uh, so basically, uh, I want to talk about data science and how we utilize it in home credit. So maybe first as a mathematician, I need to start defining my terms. So first I need to define what is data science. Uh, there is many definitions on market. It's not like one exact definition that everybody's using since it's, this is not exactly mathematics, right? So uh, I really liked uh, the definition from uh, Hadley Wickham. I hope I read it, read it right. He's, he's a chief data scientist in our studio. And basically he said that data science is a process by which data becomes understanding, knowledge, and insight. With this, I fully agree. Uh, basically for me, this is the field where you try to take data and try to derive some useful, actionable information from them. It doesn't for your decisioning. It doesn't mean like from some specific field, but basically in general, some actionable data. So it can, and I will be talking much more about how we do it in home credit and how we use data science. But I just wanted to really like stress out uh, that data science, at least for me, it's not about knowing methods. It's not about knowing algorithms. It's about forming some hypothesis, finding some data, testing some hypothesis and from understanding of your data and proper usage of your data, proving some actionable steps that should be done, either on or business or in some other field where you are trying to apply data science. Um, 
Previously, data scientists were not called data scientists. This is the trend of the past years. Before, we were simply called analysts or statisticians. Uh, now we are called data scientists. Honestly, nothing much changed. Only what changes computational power of our computer. And with this changed a lot of methods, right? Uh, before, the methods we use now would not be possible to use. But by the way, even those uh, sex and new methods that everybody's talking about, they are like 20 years old, like all the neural networks, everything like this. This is nothing super new. The only news in this is that it's finally being able to also use in praxis, in like real life, you know, before it was just theoretical concept and maybe some limited utilization. But now with all the computers and their uh, computing power, it's much easier. So uh, saying this, I would like to uh, point out some good book. Don't worry, I'm not paid by them. This is just really one book that I believe it's really representing very well what is data science. And even though this book is completely not about data science, it's called Freakonomics. I have it here. It's, I think, only book that I own two copies of the same book, one I have in Czech Republic. And then I came to Indonesia, even though I read the book, I decided to buy it again because I really like it. Uh, so what is so great about this book? Basically, it shows quite interestingly how can you use data to derive some interesting findings and without actually any prior knowledge of models. Like in this book, they are not talking about any modeling. They're really just trying to explain what kind of graphs they draw and what kind of conclusions they did. And they nicely show the difference between ca causality and correlation. Uh, because uh, in data science, if you apply a lot of black boxes, your models, if you don't understand what you are doing, can happen that it will tell you some, some relationship, but it doesn't mean that the relationship is real. And it definitely doesn't mean it will help your decisioning in the future. Right? So uh, one example from this book was uh, that basically uh, they tried to look at the data from America and they tried to look at number of policemen and number of criminals. And of course, they found out where there are more criminals, there are more policemen, right? If they would misinterpret this in the model, theoretically, they could say, OK, so if we have somewhere a lot of policemen, there is a lot of criminals. So let's decrease number of policemen and number of criminals will go down, right? But this is fully misinterpretation. And good data scientists should be able to say, no, this is this is not correct, right? Because in reality, if you would try it, you would see that actually if you decrease number of policemen, the criminality in the region will in increase, right? Uh, the number of policemen, there are a lot of policemen in regions when there is a lot of criminality because there is a lot of criminality, right? Um, also, one example from the book is uh, uh, in America, the teachers uh, are being, uh, this book is American, so it really focuses some American examples. Uh, basically, teachers are being rewarded based on how their students do some standardized tests. Uh, this system, of course, somehow financially motivates the teacher, uh, teachers to, to cheat, right? Because if they give answers to students or if they correct differently the answers or if they even, uh, for example, if they just teach the students only what they need for the test but nothing else, uh, their students will do better and they will get better uh, uh, financial reward, right? So maybe before we go on, just ask yourself a question. Let's say what kind, think about what kind of data you would need and what kind of data you would use and how would you prove that teachers are cheating, right? This is a very good exercise that data scientists do all the time. They think about, okay, so how can I prove something? What would be real proof? And this book, it really shows this very well. So for example, for this case, like, what can be teacher cheating? Well, for example, it could be uh, that they are correcting the tests after the students. Okay, so then you have to think, okay, if the teachers are correcting the test, how can you realize? Well, there will be probably some pattern that all the students share. Or, for example, uh, there will be no correlation between answering questions correctly or incorrect, or like hard questions correctly and easy co questions incorrectly. Like, if the teachers cheat, they just cheat quickly, so they like correct the answers by some kind of similar level, right? Maybe even not the whole test. So probably if a lot of students for the teacher answered hard questions correctly, but easy questions incorrectly, it could be cheating. And there is a lot of stuff in the book 
that describes this. So I really recommend this book if you have time. It is quite small and you can buy it in Indonesia. I, I did. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so really, please watch out uh, for causality and correlation and really keep in mind that even simple analytics can sometimes be very powerful. Uh, we have same example, for example, from home credit, right? Um, if, if I would build a model during pre-crisis data, and I'm not now talking about COVID because there we cannot really see the data fully yet, but for example, I'm talking about crises that were in Russia in 2013. There was a crisis, and if I would build a model on my pre-crisis data, the model will tell me, the people who have a lot of loans are good. Why they are good? Why would the model think so? The model would think so. Sorry, I was somehow muted. Uh, yeah, no worries, Kirill. Yep. So, so, so basically the people, uh, the, the people who, uh, who had a lot of loans, it means a lot of banks trust them. It means, uh, if it's not crisis, they are good because a lot of banks trust them, it means we should trust them as well. Problem comes when the crisis starts, because when the crisis starts, people who have a lot of loans, it can me it will have other meaning, it, it has a meaning that they are overdebted. And all of a sudden, these people who we before thought are the best will start to be the worst, right? This is why uh, we really need to be careful when we model and not just put first thing that comes out of the model. Because if I really modeled on my pre-crisis data, it would be like this. And this is, again, something you need to be very careful about. Uh, what I also want to talk about is difference between, like, uh, at least from my perspective, what is real data science, what is bot buzzword data science. Because but data science is very cool. Every company now wants to start doing data science. Every teams are hiring data science. It's a very discussed topic. Mm, sadly, this is good, of course. Uh, but sadly, there's also an disadvantage that this brings sort of like fake data science. You know, when people are just going by buzzword because it's easier. Uh, so there is sort of fight between real and the buzzword data science. Uh, I don't know. I think you are most of the audience will be probably too young to know Mortal Kombat, this old Mortal Kombat. This is like Mortal Kombat 2, and I really like this game as a child. So basically, there is this fight against these two data science approaches. And I would like to discuss with you my opinion, how you can recognize which one is which. So for me, in real data science, when, when people or companies or uh, teams are doing real data science, they are usually able to explain everything in a very easy, understandable manner. If the person understands data science, he can explain the basic concept even to his grandma, who never seen mathematics, for example, right? Whereas people who are teams who do not really understand much, uh, they are using a lot of scientific terms. They are not able to simplify their methods. Uh, also, uh, people, um, who like, you know, who, who use more like buzzword data science, they usually uh, begin as very complex method. Whereas people who know data science pretty well, they try with really simple methods and they build up depending on what is needed. Uh, people who do like proper data science, they usually do also understand the basics of the methods. And usually they are able to run them in any software. People who just do buzzword data science, just click. You know, they, they read on Google, so okay, you have to click, 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 and they, then they just be able to click. But this is not real data science that will bring any change to any business, I will be honest with you, at least not from my perspective. Also, you can recognize it as well by what are people focused on. Uh, usually the real data scientists already know that most important is data preparation, feature engineering. Uh, people who are sort of new to data science, they're really focused on method. They're really focused, okay, what method will I use? It's of course important, but honestly speaking, if you do proper data, data preparation and if you do proper feature engineering, uh, the method will not do the highest, biggest benefit. Um, so basically, this is something to look out for. Uh, this is, I just wanted to debunk some myths that are now on the market, so you can also choose properly uh, where you work and with whom you cooperate. And I also believe the best learning is by having some good mentors. Yeah, so. All the courses, I think, is very good, especially if there is like real mentor explaining to you, uh, because they, if they have especially some experience from the market, this is always very good. So when you are choosing company or team work for, please, or my suggestion would be, 
if you want to win in the data science and really learn how to be uh, the professional data scientist who really brings the value to the company or to the projects they do. Uh, my really understand. Uh, my really suggestion would be to you: first of all, try to understand uh, the, if the company you're going to or the team really understands what is real data science. You know, so ask them a few questions about this. Uh, try to also see if they provide some good environment for data science. For example, obviously they need to be willing to expect some failures because in data science it's sort of research. So sometimes you will fail. Yeah, and in the company where you are not allowed to fail, you will not be able to do anything innovative. Uh, you also need to check out if the company you're joining has a realistic expectation for data science. Because some of the managers believe it's like magical tool that you just wave and everything is fixed. It is obviously not. Yeah? And if, if you're going to go to a company that doesn't have people who can sort of push this reasonable thinking, you will probably be a little bit disappointed because there will be too much expectations. Also, if you are juniors, my suggestion would be if you're joining a team, just seriously ask them what projects they implemented and what were the benefits of the project. Because only like then they will, you will see if the data science is only on paper or if they really do something in reality. Because, you know, running a model, it's super easy. Like, you can, like, only running the model without understanding five-year-old's child can do. Just, you know, shift, enter, shift, enter, shift, enter, open some, you know, some pre predefined some workflow, right? And just shift, enter, shift, enter, shift, enter. So if you really want to uh, learn something, please make sure the company has also, if you are junior, of course, if you are senior, of course, you can be the one who brings this implementation project. But if you're junior, please even ask them, like, so what project did your team implement it? What did you do? Uh, what, what was the benefit? Because like this, you'll very quickly recognize. And don't be afraid to answer the, uh, a quest, ask questions to interviewer. Actually, we recently hired one, uh, one new colleague. Um, maybe he's looking, watching. And I really like what he did. Uh, he asked us, really, he asked us how would we solve some issue. He, basically, on the interview, he really asked us how we would approach solving one, one problem. And this is very good. Yeah, you should also check if people you are working with are able to answer this question. Because if they are not, well, they are probably not going to able to teach you anything. Yeah, or help you develop yourself, right? Um, and also, please check if they have proper tool, hardware, and accesses, right? If the company tells you they have data science and then they told you they only have Excel, you know, it's not going to be really data science. <laughs> Or for example, they tell you, yeah, we have data science, but then they tell you all our notebooks are two gigabytes for data science, two gigabytes RAM, and we have no server. You know, probably not gonna be much data science either. Yeah, or even like check what accesses to databases the data scientists have, right? If you don't have accesses to SQL and you have to, for example, I don't know, get the data somehow every time on request, you're not gonna be able to do much data science. So please watch out for it. It will be really good for your career, I would say. Here, I would like to quote Conf or Confucius, the Chinese philosopher, do not use cannon to kill a mosquito. So really, start from easy solutions. Why? It will be easier to implement. Uh, don't forget, if you create some solution, you have to also have to implement it or someone. So if you do simple one, it will be easier to implement, easier to test. Also, if you implement solution, don't forget, somebody has to trust it from the business. Basically, your final client is a scientist, is some business person, right? Somebody who's going to use your solution. If you make it too complicated, you are simply risking that the person will not understand it and he will be angry and not trusting your solution. So starting from easy, it, it, it can really help you. Also, you can be missing some data or misunderstanding the data. And if you start with black box hardcore solutions, uh, they are too complex for you to actually get the knowledge about the data. Also, uh, you might really get very wrong results. Uh, you should really build up. It will also help your uh, hyperparameter tuning and everything start easy and uh, you will be better at understanding the data. You will be able to better do feature engineering, and even do more advanced methods then. And you can also finish quicker, right? Why to do 
super complicated method if you can solve it with simple model. You know, like it's always better to have it simpler. Uh, so I talked about general one, like what is machine learning and what is data science. Now I would like to talk what, where is the machine learning in your daily lives. I just wanted to give a few examples and then I will talk more about home credit. Uh, in general, in your daily life, um, for example, if you have Netflix, uh, the recommendation of what movies to watch, it's done by recommender engine. It's built based on historical data of many, many clients, right? Many, many people who, who were offered different content. Then Netflix sees, okay, these people, if they offer this content, they click there. They see your historical behavior, which you clicked and which you didn't. Then go buy it to one common model, and it's sort of recommending you. These models, uh, you have to be always very careful when you build them uh, because they can have a bias. And the bias could be that, for example, if you give me 10 choices, and let's say I want to watch a movie, even if your 10 choices are very bad, probably if I want to watch the movie, I will choose one of those. So always make sure, if you do these models, make sure you also have some like random choice for the client to sort of see that you are not overfitting and then having false. Um, false reassurance that basically as yes, client picked someone, but maybe something, but maybe he picked it only because you didn't have, you didn't have give him a choice, right? Um, also targeted marketing, right? So if you look like on Facebook, you have a lot of targeted marketing, right? That they're offering you exactly for your situation, like what you want. Sometimes it's smart, sometimes it's not. Uh, very interesting in targeted marketing is that not only do they change like what to market to you, but also they change how to market it to you. So, for example, if I like swimming pools and I go and I am checking a hotel, they might show me a picture of swimming pool. But for the same hotel, for example, if my wife likes, I don't know, good food, uh, so instead of showing her for the exactly same hotel, for showing her the food, the swimming pool, they will show her the food. Uh, because, well, they have a model that predicts what she likes, yeah. Also, face recognition, right? For example, I suppose if you've been to Singapore, right, there is this automatic, you just scan your passport and without contact any human, they let you in because they compare your passport against, um, against uh, uh, your picture. Chatbots, traffic control, antiviruses is also very interesting utilization. Because all the viruses, they share some common code, right? So basically, uh, you can, again, based on code of the application, you can predict that this is virus, even though the virus is fairly new, even though, for example, nobody put it into blacklist. Many years ago, it was really about blacklist, but right now it's really predictive, which, I, from my perspective, it's quite cool. So how do we use data science in home credit or in general multi-finance institution? First, we can use it for anti-fraud. Anti-fraud is basically us trying to prevent fraudsters to steal money from us, right? So one thing is transactional fraud. In home credit, we are only starting credit cards. So here in home credit Indonesia, so here we don't use it yet, these models or simplified versions. Uh, but in other countries where we already have a lot of uh, transactions, we use the transactional fraud detection. So basically, it's uh, the machine learning is trying to learn, okay, what transactions are weird. I will give you a simple example. For example, um, and this is not done by machine learning, this is just explainable example. For example, if I'm now in Indonesia and I go to ATM and withdraw money, and in one minute I will withdraw money in, um, let's say, Thailand, this is obviously some fraud, right? Because I couldn't have gotten from ATM from Indonesia to ATM to Thailand, right? And because the bank uh, bears the responsibility for this, they will have to refund me if they give the money to this fraudulent person, who, for example, copied my credit card somehow, right? So uh, this is one model. Then we are also doing detection of false information provided by client. Uh, basically, again, we are trying to search for patterns of some kind of cheating information. Uh, there is a lot of district, like district, we can check by distribution and all of this stuff, right? Because for example, if to one, um, let's say we have point of sales or, and for one of point of sales, if uh, in one day, 10 people will come who are age 25 and uh, this is not standard distribution for this post loan, for example, 
and all these 25 year olds for example work in government and all of them have same income you know this this seems like some kind of fraud right probably organized fraud so basically uh, we are searching for pattern of uh, strangely provided information or for example if a person comes who is like 20 years old and at the same time he says his income is i don't know super huge so probably this is not true right because if if he's so young and he has such a huge income why would he need a loan right uh, then we are using bi bi biometrics and live biometrics and liveliness checks so for example to approve client on a, a phone basically he takes a picture of himself and we just check if it's really him or not and if it's not like some scan or something and we can compare it to his passport we are trying to detect fraudsters some organized fraud because again if there is organized fraud there must be some pattern uh, uh, we are also using the data science in crm which is customer relationship management we are trying to offer to client optimal product right because we have a lot of products so we check okay for which client which product is better best right because we want to offer what the client wants without him having to choose right of course the clients have the choice but we try to offer him the first choice right uh, also we are trying to understand the client because it, we can also adjust our communication based on for example customer interest right uh, we are also trying to retain our clients so for example we have a model that's saying us okay this client has very high probability to leave to competition obviously we don't want our clients to leave to competition so we are trying to offer him something interesting uh, also we have some limited call center uh, so we are optimizing our call list so we are starting to call people based on those who have the highest probability to actually answer to us right uh, because if we do it randomly we can start calling to people who really are not interested right so we have some model who tells us okay this this person has this chance of being interested this person of this chance you know so we start calling those who have the highest chance uh, in crm it is very interesting the modeling because there uh, we very quickly see uh, the negative impact or we can really see evaluate the model because we can see next day if client took or not took the loan right so we can see like very quickly the take up rate changes so this is why in crm we are much less afraid to use some black box model because if there is some issue we can see it very fast uh, for marketing we are also using uh, quite a lot of uh, data science at least we are trying to sometimes so we are trying to observe automatically competition right so we don't do it manually or also manually but we are trying to do it automatically we are trying to measure the marketing efficiency uh, we are trying to automatically read customer feedback because if customers give a feedback and it's free text somebody would have to read it right honestly nobody has time to read all the feedbacks but we also we also very much care what customers are saying because at the end of the day this is what we should do this is how our business should change based on what customer is saying right so basically we we, we try to read the feedback automatically so we can adjust we also have chatbots uh, where uh, this again sa saves our capacity because many issues the chatbot can solve before it's going to operator in, in which case we don't need uh, such a big call centers for example for others we are also trying it for hr attrition models to see what which employees are likely to leave us automated complaint handling uh, for hr we are also doing pre, uh, cv pre-screening automatic email sorting to understand which email is what and there are many many more utilizations sadly i don't have enough time or we don't have enough time in this session to talk about this so um but there are many many more applications they are really like it's very interesting time to be now the data scientist uh, i also wanted to talk shortly at least about big data uh, basically honestly speaking a lot of companies are now talking about big data uh, problem is honestly speaking from mathematical definition nobody has actually big data or is using uh, not many companies have high or are using high frequency or high, high volume big data which is a big data from mathematical definition uh, but most of the companies call big data simply external data so for example if you take some data from some external partner who has data about client we call it for now big data uh, 
Uh, still, it's quite interesting field because uh, we are cooperating as a home grid with many external partners. So, uh, for example, our analysts, because of this, have opportunity to work with very different kinds of data, which is pretty cool, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and about big data, we are all, 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 we are only now starting to really utilize high frequency big data based on some logs from our mobile apps and stuff like this. But this is only the beginning, so I do not want to talk about it much. But in general, what I see in the market, not many companies actually, many companies talk about big data, but from mathematical definitions, not many actually do big data. So how to become a data scientist? This is my quick uh, suggestion to you if you, want, if you are interested in data science and you would like to become one. So my suggestion first would be to refresh statistics. It's really also about understanding the methods. It's not only about learning how to click, it's really about refreshing the statistics, understanding the methods. Only then you can make fa good conclusions based on your models. Of course, you need to learn R or Python. This, like, without this, it will be very hard. Uh, my suggestion to use also to check Kaggle. I really like this. This is basically for data science competitions. Many, many companies, including also Home Credit, are publishing data to Kaggle, and you can win some nice prizes there as well. And there is very good community that can help you develop, and they're publishing their scripts. So uh, I here gave a list of buzzwords. I know I said that it's not good company if they give buzzword if they say a lot of buzzwords without explaining. Sadly, I do not have time because already now I'm four minutes past. Uh, we do not have time for me to go through each of the topics here, but I just wanted to discuss with you what, what you should learn if you want to start being data scientist in banking, what will help you. Like from, I, I put in bold the main stuff, you know, because other stuff you can learn on the work, but probably it will be nice to know logistic regression, understand what's Gini index and how it's used in finance, knowing what is weight of evidence and why to use it, and uh, like remembering hypothesis testing. Of course, then all the methods like LGBM, random forest decision trees, XGBoost, text mining, survival analysis, and everything like this, it will be good. Uh, but my suggestion to you, focus on the basics, only then start the more advanced methods. Mm. Please, uh, again, if, if we had to talk about every method separately, we would spend probably a few hours here, which we don't have. So please, if you are interested, look at it a bit more. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. If you would like to connect with me and ask some questions, please feel free. I, I put my LinkedIn here. And uh, let's go to the Cypher. Let me quickly maybe connect. Or sorry, sh should we now go to Cypher or should we discuss a bit more other stuff before? Uh, I think we're going to have a, a, a bit of a discussion and then the Q&A. And then okay. after that, we can do the Cypher time. So, uh, Kirill, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very, very interesting explanation. So, so rich, so a lot we have covered so far, but yet so digestible. I mean, I love how to how you put it uh, in a very, in a very, um, uh, uh, very friendly way uh, with uh, lots of uh, things that are covered in a very short time um, and. I hope I learn. I learn. I myself learn a lot of new things uh, from your session today, and I hope the the, the audience as well. In fact, uh, I was just so inspired by the book that you mentioned, and then I just ran and then get a copy of myself. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, you cover a lot uh, tonight. Uh, you mentioned about the difference about real data science and buzzword data science. We have a lot of questions about that. Uh, and I was just wondering when the sub-zero data science beat the Goro data science, is he using fatality or babality? Probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you also mentioned the applications of machine learning uh, uh, across the industry and within the finance industry and specifically within home credit. Uh, uh, but I, I, I think I think we can agree we barely scratch the surface there. I mean, there's just a lot to talk about, and then uh, unfortunately we don't have three days for the session. So um, I myself actually have a lot of questions, but I have uh, on my list here there are probably like 200 questions uh, I need to pick <laughs> uh, for you. So 
we're just gonna uh, uh, go on and answer the questions from the audience if uh, if it's okay for you, uh, Kirill. Of course. Are you still on YouTube? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the first one, uh, we have a, a questions from a question for another one from Trixie Evania. Uh, do you mind giving us an example on do's and don'ts uh, of explaining the method to business user? This is related to your slide about the real and best data science in explaining a method in an, in an understandable way. That's a very good question. Well, really try to explain it very simply. Don't use any mathematical words, ideally. Try to really show it by example. Mm -hmm. Just most of the mathematical methods, they can be explained by a very easy example at the end of the day. Uh, just even try to practice on your parents, for example. I don't know if your parents are not mathematicians, of course. If your parents are mathematicians, don't practice on your parents, yeah. But just yeah. try, or your children, or you know, someone who is not really in the field, try to explain to them before. And if they yeah. understand it, try really easy language, try a lot of examples, and usually it works, yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes. Sometimes before my presentation, I used to practice uh, in front of my cat. So, but that's no uh, no response from them. So, yeah, it doesn't help. Okay. Uh, next questions from Salomo Depi. Uh, so, how do you how do you integrate uh, different kinds of operational logistic systems, financial systems, uh, human resource system to be able to analyze the data and then uh, get a decision from it? Mm. Well, th this is more to how we archive the data. Uh, we basically have standard SQL-based DVH, plus we have Hadoop, and I'm, I hope I'm not saying some super secret stuff, but I don't think so. <laughs> so we have, we have simply Hadoop, we have DVH from basically SQL Oracle-based, and uh, there we collect all our, all our data. Like this, we prepare our data for modeling, then we push it to server, a Python server or to our notebooks if the if the data is small enough. Uh, I will be yeah. honest with you, we are now only starting to implement cloud, uh, to mm -hmm. use cloud, but honestly speaking, for most tasks, we so far didn't need it that much. Mostly it's needed for voice to text, right? And all these kind of super hard tasks, but uh, honestly speaking, right now, there is so many stuff to do that is much easier. So we are collecting mm -hmm. the low hanging fruits at the moment. Uh, yeah, and for as of for implementation, it depends which company uses which tool. Uh, like we have for each department, they have different, let's say, decision making tool, and from different company, like CRM uses decision tool A, a risk uses decision tool B, and then we just need to make sure we can program these decision tools to their decisioning system, right? But I, I'm not sure I can really talk about the details, <laughs> what tools we use. Sure. I would sure. have to check uh, it before with our PR, which, <laughs> <isn't>. <laughs> which will take three days, <laughs> which we don't have the time for. <laughs> okay, that's okay. But uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can imagine. Um, yeah, security and privacy again. That's the things that you uh, you will need to uh, really uh, take care of and. And you mentioned that before that you just uh, you just moved to cloud. Is that uh, partly also because of the uh, privacy privacy issue there uh, of of having to host the data itself? Mostly, it's computational power because computational power. like we have server, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So so far we were managing, but every time you know it's very hard and it takes long time to increase the computational power of your server. It's very mm -hmm. expensive. And sometimes you don't need it for all the time. So let's say we are doing text mining, uh, not text mining, voice to text project. And for this, we need not only CPU, but also GPU computing, right? Yeah. So to, to buy some good GPU for our server, you know, it would cost some money. Yeah. And maybe we do one voice to text project a year, you know, or like limited number of voice to text projects. And then the extra hardware we bought will be simply lying around. Whereas here we can scale up when we need it and scale down when we don't. So. Mm, yeah, yeah. So for 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 uh, scalability and practicability reasons, right? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, I have another questions that are very relevant to the current situation. So uh, this one is from Andrian Shahputra. Uh, he asked, he, he said that this pandemic situation definitely is unprecedented times and obviously affecting the economy of the most people. And maybe that leads some people to go to get some credit loans. So his question is, is the method used to determine if a person is capable of getting loan when a crisis is happening, for example for this in this pandemic, is different and compared to the normal situation from the data science perspective. If it's different, would you mind sharing the difference? From a data science perspective, I'll be honest, not that much because mm. we don't want to rebuild our models on very fresh data. Honestly speaking, the data we are collecting mm. now, I'm not fully trusting yeah, because it changes every month and you cannot really mm. build a like, model especially for mm. it. So, but what changes it's our risk uh, appetite, right? So mm. for example, uh, peop, let's say we have some score for a client, let's say score 0.3, right? So before we would approve the client with this score. Now, for example, it's too bad and we will not. So we most mm. like do it outside of the models, this kind of adjustment mm. for the crisis. We, we are more strict and we are, uh, yeah. So, 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 so the model itself probably uh, not, not, doesn't differ too much, but the decision making uh, is probably where you, where you adjust that, right? How we use the model, because usually when something is uh, dynamic and changing very quickly, it's not a good idea to put it into model. Sure. It's better to put it outside because you can quicker adjust yeah. outside sure. of the I model. Mean, yeah, I mean, it shows that um, it, still behind 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 the gun, there's uh, there's still a person that who's triggering the gun, right? I mean, who's taking the decisions and who knows best what for the businesses, and yeah. Because it's because unprecedented. We, you don't have the data. Sure. You don't have exactly. the data to build the model. Exactly. And even now, if we start using data from March, you know, the situation, even though March was COVID crisis, now it's COVID crisis, it's no longer the same. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's much yeah. different. So if you teach the model, you really risk overfitting and you risk incorrect decisions. It, it, yeah. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was also thinking myself uh, back in April and March, I was, I was just wondering that, hmm, I was wondering that all predictions model will be wrong. <laughs> Because it's just it's just a different world we're living today. It is worse. It is worse. But honestly speaking, if you build your models in advance with some kind of not overfitting it too much, mm -hmm. uh, your models are fairly robust. I was quite mm -hmm. surprised that our models did not fall as much as I expected. Like oh, cool. Like we seen the crisis already. Like Hong Kong is international, right? So we first mm -hmm. seen the crisis in China because we have business in China as well. Ah. So already in like February, I was really afraid what's going to happen here with our models. Uh, but luckily, even from China and even from here, we see that the models didn't fall as much as I would expect. Of course, there is some ah, fall in okay. predictability because the population changed. But mm -hmm. I must say it's not that bad as I, as I was worried. Do, do, you, do, you, do you take uh, some insights or wisdom from, from China or other, or other countries and then take it to Indonesia? Yeah? That's course. awesome. This That's is our awesome. biggest benefit, right? If I compare yeah. our company to competition, um, our biggest benefit is that we are international, so we can take knowledge yeah. and we also uh, exchange people between countries, right? This is why I'm in Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Wow. Okay. Um, so next, I think we, had, we, we do have a couple of uh, questions uh, and time left. So this one is from Yolanda Herman. Uh, what is the added value of chatbots or voice bots in terms of effectiveness compared to human approach? Uh, what we need to consider in implementing chatbot based on your observation? Okay, I don't honestly remember for the chatbot. So I cannot answer this because as, as I like shown, we are doing quite a lot of stuff. But in general, like I would say, Honestly speaking, we as Home Credit, at the moment, most of our chatbot solution, we are uh, buying from external company. Uh -huh. Why? Uh, because it would take us, like we would need a much bigger team to develop our own chatbots. Like we're discussing that we might start our own rule-based chatbot, right? So basically mm -hmm. you create text mining, which is, which we are, like we have a lot of text mining models 
like that we are doing right now. So this is no problem. We create text mining. So we understand what is the topic about. And then based on the topics and based on some keywords, we will create some uh, rule base, like if, if this else replied this, if this replied this. This is not something super sophisticated. This is something I believe can be done even by small data science team. From my perspective, doing proper chatbot that will really be like sort of intelligent without this if if logic that you write script to it, you know, and write okay if if client asks this answer, this, you know, this you you know if you want to do it automatically to it, I don't think it's possible by small data science team. Yeah, it yeah. is. It, it will take two years, but honestly speaking, since it's quite cheap to buy it outsourced, we are not doing it. Yeah, I was once involved in a in an LP NLP project, and especially with Bahasa Indonesia, oh man, okay. <laughs> it's a big challenge. <laughs> so I can imagine that. So uh, we do have five minutes left, and we have uh, 190 questions left. Okay, let's do this. In credit card, in credit scoring modeling, this one is from Nanda Anzana. In credit scoring modeling, what do you think is better to use a scorecard such as? FICO scoring or a credit default risk model, like the challenge held by Home Credit in Kego? Well, I always prefer to use a built model by us, right? Because mm. we can better adjust for our population and our specific case. Because FICO score, it is just generally built on whole population. By the way, on Indonesian market, it's not even available. There is no FICO score in Indonesia. This is more American thing. Uh, I think in China they have as well. In Indonesia, I did not hear about, and they would probably offer to us because we are cooperating with them on some projects. So I'm pretty sure if they had something, they would offer it to us. Uh, mm. But usually what we do, we, if we have some external partner who's providing some scores, we are building our own score, and then we are trying to statistically combine their score and our score, mm. right? To have the best of the both, both worlds. But of course, since their score is paid, we are also co ca calculating some cost-benefit analysis. Hmm. Okay. Good, and uh, he also asked, uh, is it possible to mimic FICO scoring with regression or a linear or polynomial model? Of course, like FICO score is not some super, it is not some, like, it is just score, yeah. It's like some either logistic regression or XGBoost. If you have same data, you can yeah. uh, have the same model, yeah. Like, uh, I'm not sure I can share. The, like, we have also business in US, and you, even in US, we actually did not use FICO score. We built our own score because it was stronger at the end of the day. Hmm. But we had very specific clients, that's why. Yeah, like in US, we focused on very specific clients. And our business in US is very unique from all other home credit businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and this was before, and then we started to use the combination, which is the best. But yes, you can definitely replicate FICO score. It's, like, you know, standard scorecard. If you know how to build scorecard, you can build the same scorecard mm -hmm. or better, depending on what kind of data you have. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Kirill. Uh, I hope that answer your questions, Nanda. Uh, probably one last question before we go into the uh, uh, cipher challenge. Uh, this one is from Acho or Akotaha. Uh, hello, Kirill. A very nice session. I have a question. In your opinion, what are the areas that haven't utilized data science or machine learning widely yet and have the opportunity to disrupt the business in that area? Oh, there is so much. There is so much, I think. <laughs> like, honestly, even like CRM uh, uh, and marketing are just starting. Like, uh, oh, even marketing is just starting. Okay, that's interesting. From my perspective, yes. Like, it depends where, of course. Like, some countries know, some uh, companies maybe they are not. But, like, I just think even here it's just starting, you know. Like, still there is a lot of manual stuff that is being done. Like, you know, in, in credit risk, like 40 years ago, or I don't know how many years ago, I was not in the business back then. Uh, so mm. basically what happened, when you wanted the loan, you actually went to someone and this person was approving you, right? Mm. Really someone listened to you and this person who, 
who you give your data the, the decision, right? Right now, it's fully automatic. Uh, I don't even think it's better in like predictiveness. I think people have quite good predictiveness. Why it's better? It's faster, cheaper, and also you have more control because to model you can say decrease uh, approval rate by five percent. To human, you cannot say okay now approve five percent less people. You know, human don't work in this way. So if you know, so and I believe in marketing CRM, it's still like really not like this that much. Uh, but I still believe there is so much utilization that I don't even know where to start, like even in law. Yeah, like mm. I, mm. law, fashion, fashion, by the way, mm. fashion lawyers, for example, in, in fashion, uh, they can start really checking the mo more about customer interest, right? They can mm. start really measuring of what trends they did and how they impacted their sales. But I'm not into fashion, so I don't know. Maybe they are doing it already. But like I'm supposing that not that much. Yeah, or even uh, yeah, like the, the second, yeah, like even agriculture. Yeah, right. You can start in agriculture to really think how to optimally do your decisioning. There is so many fields where data science can still help. In bank, uh, I definitely think HR is definitely underused. Uh, mm. Marketing, it's maybe slightly better. CRM, even slightly better than marketing. But even there, I still believe there is much, much, much like areas to approve. Yeah. Uh, but from bank, which probably I should comment the most because th this is the background I have, I would say in HR, there should be much more utilization, right? Because when you work with people, you can also like understand who is demotivated, how to motivate them. You know, uh, if we have a lot of meeting, if we don't have too much meeting, you know, just this kind of stuff. Even how to hire correct people, you know, all this is can be really scientified. Let's say. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, uh, if, if even if we take a look at Indonesia. Uh, 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 the the digital transformation is just happening, and then for that to collect data and being able to utilize that, oh, it's just we are we are still very early uh, on the progress there. So it's a very uh, uh, exciting uh, uh, trends we are currently uh, in. So uh, Kirill, I think I think that's all we have for the discussions for the talks. Thank you very much. I couldn't even summarize what you shared uh, with us today. It's so much. We talked about the real data scientists. We talked about the buzzword. We talked about the book. That is very good. Also, I recommend it to you guys as well. We're not selling it. We're just both a fan of it. Right? <laughs> we talk also about Mortal Kombat and uh, the applications of uh, more, not Mortal Kombat in uh, machine learning in various industries and especially uh, in the financial sector. So uh, please stay safe, uh, stay healthy, stay socially distancing but digitally connected. I am Andian. Uh, thank you, Kirill, once again. Thank you. Good night and see you at the next talk. On bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.